introduce the AKU Society team. So my name is Juliet Rowe and I'm the fundraising manager for the AKU Society and obviously we're all working at home so I'm at home um, and yeah everyone else in the team if you can introduce yourself maybe Kieran can you start? Yeah so I'm Kieran Scott I'm the head of projects and communications at the AKU Society so I run the website uh, social media talk to quite a lot of international patients and everything in between really. Uh, Leslie? Hi, I'm Leslie, the um, Head of Patient Support and Welfare at the AKU Society. Um, I generally support all the UK patients that have AKU, work very closely with Ranga and the team in Liverpool. And of course, for those of you that have attended, um, organise the international patient workshops as well. Then Great. <laughs> yeah, so shall I just get started also? Yeah, Nick, yeah. I'll, I'll go on mute now, but you just go ahead. Okay, yes, uh, so I'm Nick. Uh, I am the chair and CEO of the AKU Society. I have uh, two teenage boys with Al Captainuria. Um, so we, the AKU Society, we've been working now for 17 years. We were set up in 2003 uh, in Liverpool by Ranga, who's here, and a patient called uh, Bob Gregory, who passed away a few years ago, but some of you will know him. And so for the past <laughs> 17 years, we have been working really on uh, trying to support AKU patients uh, in the UK, but also as much as possible around the world, um, and also develop a treatment uh, really for this pretty debilitating rare genetic disease. Um, so in the first few years, um, we were just kind of, well, we were all a bunch of volunteers really, and we started off uh, by paying for the autopsy of a patient who donated her body to science in 2005. And that led to a certain understanding of AKU. And then after that, uh, we set up a, a scientific program at the University of Liverpool, where Ranga um, joined forces with someone called Professor Jim Gallagher, uh, who's been very instrumental in our research. And there we did a three year PhD program on a cell model of AKU. Um, after that, we um, found some funding to develop an animal model of AKU, which was very important and which we still have. We now have several animal models, there are several mouse models, and also what was called a natural history study. Uh, this was from 2007 to 2009, where a number of patients came to Liverpool and Ranga then studied them and developed something called the AKU Severity Score mm -hmm. Index, which was then used for our clinical trials. And things really picked up uh, exactly 10 years ago, actually, in 2010, when we put together a consortium um, to uh, really try and work on the drug nitisinone. So you have all heard of nitisinone. Um, it is a very good drug. Uh, it was originally developed as a weed killer in the 80s by a company called ICI. And then they realized that it worked in the same metabolic pathway in plants as in humans, and so was then in the early 90s developed for a disease called hereditary tyrosinemia type 1. And AKU is just one step off that, up that pathway. So the Americans under Dr. Bill Gahl at the National Institutes of Health started to study the drug for AKU. But unfortunately, the trial that they did failed um, because in retrospect, we realized it didn't last long enough. It didn't have enough patience and it was only looking at single hit rotation. And that's why Ranga developed uh, the AKU severity score index as a way of really tracking all the different elements of AKU in a single score. So that's the hips, the eyes, the ears, the heart, the spine, etc., which then allows us to track the disease over time. So in 2010, 2011, we set up a European consortium um, that brought together uh, two patient groups, Alcap in France and AKU site in the UK, a pharmaceutical company, Sobi, who owned the license to the drug, who at first were very reticent to work with us. Um, but then when we showed to them how we were a very credible uh, group, how we had um, access to patients and how also we could secure funding from the European Commission, uh, they then agreed to join <laughs> us and um, different universities and also three mm. clinical trial centers. So there was Ranga leading the whole consortium uh, based at Liverpool. And then we had a clinical trial center in France at the Hôpital Necker en Fort Malade, and then one in Slovakia at the National Institute of Rheumatic Diseases. Um, so what I'm gonna do is take you through a little bit, develop a cure, also the National AKU Center we've, uh, we've set up and also other research we're doing. And then I will hand over to Ranga who will go into the detail 
of Developer Q and also of the National AKU Centre and anything else he, he wants to raise with you, uh, you know, to really give you an opportunity to understand all the work that's been going on. Um, so in, we, we, we managed to secure funding from the European Commission. We secured six million euros and out of more than 500 applications, our application came first with a score of 15 out of 15. So we were really pleased, but it was a heck of a lot of work, particularly over the Christmas period because the deadline was just early January. So we were very pleased when we got the funding and then we launched in November 2012 in Slovakia in Piesteny. Um, with three studies, one called Sonia 1, suitability of nitisinone in alcaptonuria 1, to detect the dose needed, one called Sonia 2, suitability of nitisinone in alcaptonuria 2, which was a four-year trial on 138 patients to see whether the drug actually worked, and then also what was called a cross-sectional study, SOFIA, suboctronotic features in alcaptonuria, to see at what age the damage actually starts, okay? Um, so <clears throat> I won't go into the detail about these studies because Ranga will explain exactly what we did and how we did it, um, but the end result has been positive um, through um, a number of meetings last year. So the, the last trial, the Sonia 2 trial, ended in January 2019, that's when the last patient was seen. And then Ranga and the team at SOBI uh, pulled over all the data and then announced um, that the data was statistically significant. And so that then led SOBI to uh, file a, a submission with the European Medicines Agency, which is the regulatory agency that deals with the whole of Europe, for what's called a marketing authorization. That means for a license. And we hope to hear by the end of this year whether the marketing authorization has been approved. And we're, we're, we're pretty optimistic. Obviously, you'll never know for sure but um, we're pretty optimistic. Um, oh, so Olivier, hello, I'm French, I'm not bilingual. Is there a way to translate or another way to understand you? Um, so I don't know if Zoom does translations. I know Facebook does. I, I've responded privately and I just said this will be in English, but obviously Nick, you do speak French. So if you wanted to get into Right, okay. Yes, uh, that'll be Because bit... I think it'll be a bit too complicated if- well, we... Maybe I can speak to Olivier then separately at some yeah, point. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. Well, I have responded just privately saying that. Right, Great, sorry. thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, we're hopeful that that will be positive and that will then mean that countries uh, around Europe uh, can then hopefully access the drug once their individual high technology, uh, health technology assessment agencies have actually approved it uh, for reimbursement. So we know it's not the end of the journey, but we're getting close, you know, which is great. Um, so that was, um, we, we learned the other day that this was actually the largest ever study done for an inherited metabolic disorder in history, you know, so it really is quite iconic, you know, and we wanted to thank everybody who was on the study and who helped for making it a success. <clears throat> in parallel, in 2012, uh, we secured funding from NHS England, the National Health Service in England, to set up the National AKU Centre at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital under Ranga's directorship. And that also has gone very well. And Ranga will talk a bit about, you know, what's happened there and the results there. Um, <clears throat> but we're seeing really positive results for nitisinone and um, as a treatment for AKU. So I think as a, as a rare genetic disease, we're actually in a very fortunate position um, to have a treatment which hopefully will soon be approved because out of 7,000 rare genetic disease, diseases, I think only three or 400 actually have um, any form of approval. So this is really good. <clears throat> so um, the other thing is, is that nitisinone is now off patent since 2017 in Europe and since 2013 in the US. This means that generics companies are now producing it often at a cheaper price, up to a third of the price. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that develops. But I would say that that is a good thing for AKU patients because it means there is more choice and there is cheaper price which means hopefully it'll be more accessible. So a little bit about the other stuff that we have been doing. Um, we are looking particularly at two other strands of research. One is a gene therapy. So the idea there is that if we could correct the genetic mutation that happens in AKU, people would in effect be completely cured, okay? And so um, uh, myself and Ranga and the team uh, at the University of Liverpool under Professor George Bulgarios, 
have actually been working on an application for this for funding for nearly two years now because it's really complicated and we hope to submit that in September and if successful we would have a three to four year um, um, study in mice to actually develop this gene therapy. <clears throat> and the other thing that is happening also in Liverpool is working on something called TAL, which is a plant enzyme that breaks down tyrosine in the gut. So you will know that when you go on nitisinone, your tyrosine goes through the roof, and that can lead to problems with the eyes or also the skin. If we manage to develop this treatment, we're working with an American company on this, uh, it might still take a few years if successful, Patients would be able to take nitisinone with this other pill, this plant enzyme, it would break down tyrosine in the gut and you would in effect have a really, really effective treatment with very few, if any, side effects. Um, a few other things that we're working on. Um, Kieran is working on an app uh, to help with patient identification. Uh, so this would be something people can download and then um, take pictures of their eyes and ears and we could then identify whether they potentially have got AKU. This is experimental, but we're working on that. Uh, a new website you'll see has been launched. Um, Kieran was leading on this and you'll see it's much simpler to use and everything, which is really good. Um, we're doing a lot of fundraising. So Juliet has been leading on fundraising. There's a number of things we have secured. We have secured 30,000 euros to do an international scientific workshop, uh, hopefully in a year's time in, 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 uh, in Slovakia. Um, and also uh, Juliet has secured funding to do an international patient workshop, which Leslie um, is starting to organize. And that will take place in um, uh, probably spring of next year in Liverpool. So if you have any questions, about the patient workshops, whether that's international or national ones, um, or about fundraising or about communications, you can ask Leslie, Kieran and Juliet. And finally, we are working on a patient registry. Uh, this is, we're working this with the National AKU Centre and hopefully it would be a global registry where we can actually input data about patients and about how your health is evolving to then allow us to track over time um, and get a better idea of how AKU is affecting us. And we have a new addition to the team there, Leslie and her cat. Dog, sorry, it's a dog. Um, excellent, well, well, that's it. Um, I think we'll be taking questions later, um, but I uh, just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you for the, to the AKU team for organizing this. And I'll hand over to Professor Ranganath. Oh, I just wanted to quickly say on questions, if you guys have any, please just write them in the chat and then after Ranga speaks, we can go through them. Um, it just makes it a bit easier. And obviously, if you have some on your mind, you can put it in the chat. So, and yeah, Ranga, if you could speak now, that'd be great. Okay, so what to be is it? Uh, so, uh, Nick, you've covered quite a lot. I'm not sure um, too much extra detail is needed to go into it, but nevertheless, I'll have a go. Uh, but the opportunity for asking questions for things that I'm not going into great detail will be there after. So I'll be fairly brief. So it's better, I think, this is done as Q&A. Um, let's touch on Dowler for Cure then. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the uh, wonderful studies uh, that we carried out with the help of a lot of you here, including you know people from overseas came for the initial natural history study that we carried out between 2007 and 2011. So thank you everyone for having made this possible because without your help, we couldn't have done it. Um, so let me go straight on to the uh, wonderful years of um, um, you know, uh, clinical uh, developments rather than about the research preceding it. So if let's start mm. with Dalapa Cure. I mean, Dalapa Cure was awarded to us in 2012. And we started end of 2012 um, in three clinical sites, Liverpool, Paris, Pesh study. Uh, and we did a wonderful job because we recruited the largest number of patients because you know, we have been um, really lucky uh, to have recruited 138 patients in all, uh, in all three sites. Of which, uh, incredibly, because half the patients didn't get nicotinone, incredibly, um, you know, 108 of them um, finished the study. So 108 out of 138 is not too bad at all. 
uh, and it's, a, it's really a testament to all the patients who are coming uh, to the clinical sites and seeing this four-year clinical trial through. Um, there were lots of interesting things that happened during the study which I won't go into uh, and of course I realize I haven't talked about Sophia or I haven't talked about Sonia one and I'm sure you can ask some questions about those if you like at the end of it. Um, the, uh, we finished the study in January 2019 and um, as Nick has already said um, we then looked at all the results with the pharmaceutical company Sobi, who magnificent and this was actually a midsummer stay in Stockholm exactly a year ago that we got together and we found out that uh, the results were good it's encouraging uh, we only wanted to we were only asked to show a metabolic effect that means an effect on the homogenic acid in the blood and in the urine and any sort of possible benefit to patients in terms of trend rather than statistically significant analysis when we're dealing with the European Medicines Agency. For us, fortunately, we've actually found a lot of statistically significant results. Uh, and therefore, the decision to go ahead with the marketing authorization uh, was fairly easy. There have been some surprises. We found more infections in people who are on nicotinone uh, and uh, 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 I, I won't comp complicate it too much. It's not anything to do with nicotinone itself because nicotinone has been used in hereditary thalassemia for more than 30 years in babies at much higher doses. And this infection risk has not been reported in them. So this is something about nicotinone and alcaptonuria. And we think it might be because homogenic acid itself is protective against infections and of course if you get rid of it by taking nicotinone then maybe your risk of having infections is more like that of a person without AKU. Of course this is just conjecture, this is a guess. Uh, we didn't have a group, um, a normal group uh, who we followed for four years to see if they got infections because that's the only way to compare and be careful. But of course this has implications um, for uh, those who are on nicotinone, because if there is a higher risk uh, of infections uh, compared to not being on it, uh, then we have actually told our patients uh, through the website about this, we advise them what to do and so on. As I said, the risk is only normalized like a normal person, so it's not an increased risk in the true sense we think. Um, other than that, everything is positive. There are more eye problems in patients on nicotinone, which was not surprising because this was a much higher dose uh, than the one that was used in the NIH clinical trial. We were using 10 milligrams of nicotinone rather than the two milligrams, uh, and we didn't control diet. Uh, okay, um, and, and when I come to the National Alcohol Center there, we are actually monitoring diet. We are actively intervening in diet on a day-to-day -day basis. We're checking the thylacine levels, um, for those of you who are not completely sure, nicotinone uh, is very good for AKU because it blocks the tyrosine pathway. So the tyrosine cannot become homogenic acid if you take nicotinone. Therefore, homogenic acid level, the cost of AKU uh, is, is, if you like, almost cure because it's more than 99% down or, or on the nicotinone 10 milligrams, both in the blood and the urine. So for all practical purposes, that's a biochemical cure. Um, but the downside of that is you now can no longer break down tyrosine um, that you need to. Therefore, it accumulates. Uh, and normally, of course, if it was a clinical practice where patients were being seen in the clinic, we would be putting them in touch with the dietitian and monitoring the tyrosine and dealing with that and making sure they didn't get problems. But of course, in the Saudi clinical trial, patients were coming from all over Europe and we couldn't do that. So we decided right at the start that we weren't going to do that. Like in the NIH trial, they also didn't do any diet. Uh, and um, the, the, uh, 10 people out of uh, the 68 patients who got, the 69 patients who got nicotinone developed eye problems. Uh, and the several of them have had to drop out because that was part of the study protocol. So apart from that and the infections, there was absolutely nothing 
unusual or uh, important for me to convey in terms of safety. So the safety is pretty good for all the reasons that I uh, just explained. And I'm sure if you've got any questions, we can go into that later. Um, so we are now simply waiting for the decision from the European Medicines Agency uh, to let us know when it is going to be licensed. And of course, there are challenges after that, as well as Nick has already said it about then each of the countries approving um, the use of Litrisinon in their country. And even after that, there's a challenge because then the funding has to be available and your local hospital and regions will need to agree to provide it. So there's still, still some challenges to go through, but I'm sure we will get there. Uh, the most important thing is if the data is good to show that Nitrosinol is working and uh, improving AKU, not just decreasing homogen gas, I think it's relatively easy uh, to, to, um, uh, to make this happen. And that data is there. Um, just to finish off that bit of it, so we have now uh, got a paper in a really prestigious journal called the Lancet Diabetes and Technology. Uh, it is one of the top journals in the world. Uh, and they have accepted the data from the Sonia 2 for publication. So it's been accepted. They're in the process of actually getting it out in terms of print. And once it's out in the print, we will let everybody know through the website uh, that this has now come out. So you'll be able to access it and go forward from there. I'm now going to switch tack. Um, and say to you, there's something about the National Center, uh, because a number of people who are here, who are, here are um, also attending the National Center. Center. Um, we have identified about 20 people as being possibly high risk uh, for, uh, because of the COVID situation that we have. Uh, and these are mostly people who have diabetes and other health problems, not anything to do with AKU itself. Um, uh, uh, you know, although we caution people that if they have um, uh, aortic valve problems, especially if uh, they had a bit of heart failure, they should watch out a bit. Uh, but other than that, uh, we have also warned people about the nitrosinone uh, and, um, you know, all of that information has been put on the AQ website. So there's nothing more to say on that. So just to give you an idea, in the National Center now, over the years since 2012 when we started, uh, we have had uh, 87 people come to Liverpool at least once. And there are 70 plus people who are now um, attending Liverpool and around 50 to 60 of those have received nitrosinone at various times. Uh, people from Wales, unfortunately, have not been able to receive nitrosinone because of the peculiarities of the uh, healthcare system there. And hopefully the NICE pathway and other commissioning development that we are following, if it comes through, that will take care of it, we hope and make it available to everybody without the postcode lottery uh, happening there. Uh, in terms of the uh, NAC, I stepped down as the, natural, you know, as the clinical director of the National Center in January this year, but I'm back on because my colleague who took over the clinical directorship, Dr. Milad Kether, unfortunately has had some personal issues uh, and he's, uh, he's on compassionate leave now starting uh, just about a, month, a week ago, a week or two weeks ago, and we don't know exactly when he'll be back. So I'm uh, back working full time uh, uh, as a clinical director again. Um, uh, uh, and um, I'm really happy to be doing what I can during this time. Um, I'm just checking to see if there's anything else I want to bring out there. And we've done a lot of publications in the, uh, with the National Center data because <coughs> we, have, we have now used uh, nitrosinone 2 milligrams in the National Center since 2012. So it's now seven to eight years of nitrosinone in some of the patients. I'm really delighted to say that the effect of the nitrosinone is still there after eight years. The data is really good and we are publishing a lot and we're really helping a better understanding of alkaphenia through all the things that we've done. So uh, I'm really Really thankful to all the patients come to the National Center uh, who are doing it. Hopefully, they're benefiting as well. And uh, you know, some of them may want to share their personal experiences of how they're feeling on Nitrosinone uh, once I finish. Um, I, I'm just thinking if there is anything else there, or should I stop? Oh yeah, so just a bit of news about how the how we restart. The National Center has been closed since uh, April. 
because of the COVID-19. We did, the, the hospital closed everything, uh, uh, not just here in uh, Liverpool, but throughout the country, all hospital activities have ceased except for COVID-19. So only COVID-19 patients are allowed to come in unless, of course, uh, you have life-threatening conditions or something like that. So clinics and other things have all been cancelled since then, and including the National Capital Centre monthly clinic that we were carrying. So there will be no clinics in April or May or June or July. We hope we to start in August, uh, and we are working with our uh, our own in-house team to see how we do that. And one of the things uh, that's happening seems to be that we will have less room to see patients. Therefore, we have also been given less time. We are only going to have two days uh, in a month to bring patients in uh, for the National Centre. Uh, and therefore, we're thinking about what we want to do in those two days so that everything is safe um, uh, for our patients uh, when they come. Uh, and of course, we will be taking every precaution to minimize any co coronavirus risk while they're here. And all of those things um, will be in place for patients to come. I suspect some of you patients will be worried about coming, but I'm trying to reassure you that we are making it as safe as it's humanly possible for you guys to come um, so that you don't pick up um, coronavirus while you're here. Um, uh, is, it's, I'm just uh, sort of thinking, is there anything else I need to say? Um, uh, but if, if while patients are not coming, we have still been uh, supporting them. For example, patients who are due to come in April, May, June, and July, we're getting them to do blood spots at home. We're checking the tyrosine levels. We're still getting our dietitian uh, to be involved with them, to advise them on what they should be doing. So we are doing all of that uh, remotely, even though the clinics are not happening. Uh, all patients are still getting the nitrogen as they should. Um, so uh, for us, in some ways, it's um, business as usual for some aspects of the AQ service. Although uh, all the uh, important tests that we carry out on people to help uh, keep on understanding alkaplurea has sort of fallen by the wayside a little. But that we hope will all restart. Uh, uh, in August, and uh, this uh, this uh, this COVID nineteen is likely to be around for a while. So we will just have to adapt, and we will manage, and and we will keep going. So I I, I could go on, but I'm not going to. I'll stop <laughs> there, and I'm sure you will have questions. And if there are any questions um, that come to me, I'm very happy to elaborate further. So thank you, Julia. Do you want me to go through? We've got some questions in the chat. Do you want me to just read them out to you, Ranga? Yeah, or oh, Nick, whoever you've got the question for, just uh, uh, to say who it's for and I'm happy to. Uh, they, they, haven't, they haven't specialized, but I, okay. I guess you and Nick. They're mainly for you, Ranga. Yeah, I okay. think they are mainly for you. So uh, we've got uh, Robert uh, in Sweden, 71 years old. I got shingles two years ago. The pain doesn't stop. Has that something to do with AKU? And my eye doctor says I'm about to get, I think it's glaucom. I don't know. Um, yeah. Is that also connected to AKU and Orphodin? Um, and he says he does eat meat. Yeah, I think, uh, but let me answer the question about the, uh, the uh, shingles first. So shingles is herpes zoster. It's due to a virus. Um, uh, is that person on nitrogen? Um I think so. I mean, he can maybe say in the chat or if you want to speak about it, Robert, you can unmute yourself. It's up to so, you. Okay. Let, yeah, let, I'm let, obviously better unmuting. Hmm. Yeah, so if, if uh, as I said, this whole business about the infection issue of the nitrogen has now come up. So based on uh, our understanding then, uh, we are thinking that homogentisic acid in people with the AKU might be offering protection against infection. That's the theory. Now, each of you, it'll be wonderful if those who are here with the AKU can feed back to Juliet after that to see if they have had less infection as far as they can think while they've been growing up uh, than uh, maybe the rest of the family. So if there's that information, feed us through because it will help us understand better about the AKU state to see uh, how, how it is. And if 
HEA is protective, then AKU is a protective state against infection. And, there are, and this is not uncommon in conditions which are genetic. It, they persist for reasons because they offer some benefit to people. So that's the first thing I would say. And I think if you're taking two milligrams of nitrogen, your homogen acid levels come down by more than 95%. And it's theoretically possible that the shingles might have come on after that. But equally, it's possible a lot of people get shingles even though they haven't got AKU and even though they have not got uh, uh, nitrogen. So it is impossible to say for sure, uh, but it is possible that uh, the uh, nitrogen might be playing a part. Um, but again, there are vaccinations against herpes that you can go to to minimize any future risk. Uh, and uh, if you, if I, I don't know how long this person has been on nitrogen and how long it took to get the shingles, because shingles basically comes on because you had chicken pox when you were young, the virus is still there in your body, hasn't gone away, and simply reactivates at, at uh, intervals. And there are good treatment for shingles. So you need to pursue all that. Of course, one option, extreme option, is to stop nitrogen. And I, I mean, you can try that and see whether it helps uh, recovery from shingles quicker. Uh, but, but my suspicion is that it probably would. But especially if it's in the eye or uh, important areas, then of course you have the option of stopping nitrogen for a period of time and seeing whether that helps recovery further. The second thing was about the glaucoma. I think we've always had questions about the glaucoma because you've got pigment in the eye and uh, there is homogenic acid in the uh, what is called the aqueous chamber in the, in the eye. So the eyeball has liquid in it. And this liquid is continuously being formed and drained. And therefore there is a pressure, certain pressure in the eyeball. So the eyeball you can see is, uh, is a nice and round and it has a certain tension to be able to maintain that shape. And that's called uh, ocular pressure. So if, if, and this ocular pressure can go up if the, uh, if the fluid that's being filtered can't be drained away. Okay, and that's called glaucoma, so to put it simply. So if there is homogenic acid in the fluid, which there is, then theoretically it could block up the drainage channels and lead to glaucoma. Um, I'm happy to say to you, based on looking at our 87 patients who come to the National Center, the uh, prevalence of glaucoma is very low. There are only two or three people who ever had that. And even people who had a lot of pigment in the eye um, didn't have glaucoma. So uh, I, I'm not convinced that this is a big issue uh, in terms of um, the AKU. In any case, there are some very good treatments these days for glaucoma. So that needs to be addressed. Of course, untreated glaucoma is not good for you because you can have impairment of your vision. Um, so that, that um, I hope that sort of um, answers the question. Thank you. Probably, yeah, I've given, probably, probably given too much information. <laughs> I would just say um, he's had shingles two and a half years and often for four years. Um, I'm just a bit conscious about time. So yeah, we'll try to go through these quickly and obviously you can contact us and Ranga. You want me to have shorter <laughs> responses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but we just want to get through all of these because these are great yeah. questions. So how many questions have we got? Oh, uh, how many have got? One, two, da, 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 da. I'd say about ten. Okay, that's I'll a, be fast. That's, that's a quick glance. So yeah, we'll just yeah. go through these. But like we said, we can answer in more detail if you get in touch with us. So the next oh. one is from. Forgive me if I say this wrong. Gisela or Gazella. Um, so she says, I would like to hear from you about the evolution studies about AKU. In the last internal medical appointment in the St. Mary Hospital in Lisbon, a doctor said to me the AKU studies began again because of some doubts about bones and nitrogen effects. I would like to clarify this question. Okay. Um, the AKU is a condition that it's present at birth and then over time it takes hold and it can get worse and worse and worse without treatment. Okay. Generally, around the age of 50 and over, the um, condition starts to get more severe uh, and it can affect a lot of systems. It can affect, uh, we can cause stones in the kidney, 
and if you're a man in the prostate uh, and in other areas, it also cause fractures, it could cause osteoporosis and therefore <laughs> fractures. Uh, it can of course cause spine disease and joint disease. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of systems it can pick up because homogenic acid is depositing in the tissues in the body and causing the problem. Um, the good news is we have just published a paper saying that some of this is actually reversible, uh, especially in the eye and the ear. A lot of the patients coming from the National Center will know that the pigment is clearing up. And if that is happening inside, then there's good news that even if you've got advanced disease, there is some removal of pigment and therefore some opportunity to get better. Uh, in terms of uh, the benefit, what we have seen is um, if you've got very, but some of the features are more difficult to reverse. For example, if you've got spinal disease, then or severe joint disease in the hip or knee, there's a lot of pigment, there's a lot of breakdown of tissue, then that's not reversible. It's not going to benefit. It's a bit like taking a tablet for cholesterol to bring your cholesterol down to prevent heart attacks. But if you already had a lot of heart attacks, um, uh, then uh, the damage left by it isn't going to get better. It's still there. Okay, and even if you bring your cholesterol down, uh, the accumulation from the previous will still cause some heart attacks. So uh, in the same way here, uh, I think the earlier you start, the better the chance <laughs> you've got of completely preventing the condition. Uh, and at the moment, we think, based on the Sophia study in Develop a Cure, it can take hold even by the age of 16. It's, uh, it, certainly the youngest patient that we saw in Develop a Cure was age 20, and it was, or the, there was pigment there already. In the National Center, even at the age of 16, we have seen pigment. So we are doing a pediatric study, which unfortunately has got held up because of COVID-19, called SOFIA Pediatric, which will tell us when the pigment really starts. Is it earlier than 16? And if so, what is the safe time to start uh, nutrition? And for some of you, you will know that uh, we, there are some issues about nutrition on treatment in hereditary tyrosinemia type 1 in babies. Uh, they get learning difficulties, which means we think the tyrosine going up can affect the brain. Uh, but we haven't seen anything like that in adults that we've been treating since 2012. We do what's called psychometry studies. And these studies have shown that it's completely safe. We haven't found any, any change at all. So, uh, as, so I hope that answers the question. So uh, a lot of the features are reversible and they improve. Uh, patients feel better, they're more mobile, the range of motion improves. Um, there are, in the uh, Sonia 2 study, there were more fractures in those who didn't take nitrocinone. Um, uh, the osteoporosis got worse in patients who didn't take nitrocinone. So uh, I, I think that probably directly explains, uh, answers the question that's been asked. Sorry, I can't give a shorter answer. I mean, you know, you have <laughs> to, fine, fine. to to be sensible. There's nothing else you can do. You kind of um, answered, obviously, the next question is from <laughs> saying, is there still going to be a children's study potentially? So I don't know if you have yeah. anything else to add to the Sophia Pediatric study, or is it just pushback at the moment? Uh, I mean, still, it's going to be led by Birmingham. Uh, it's going to be a UK study um, only at the start. I, I, they know that um, there, there's a... A Polish physician, pediatrician, who's already following up children. I think he's got about 10 to 15 children that he's been following up for more than a year. Uh, so hopefully we will merge all the numbers uh, and, and then have a better idea once we get going. So what? So the idea, the Sophia Pediatrics, a five-year study. So uh, and we want to do a photograph of the eye and yes, see when the pigment starts. Uh, we want to take an x-ray at the start and at the end of five years, an MRI scan at the start and at the end of five years of the spine. Uh, and then we want to do questionnaires and we want to do um, uh, you know, a special technique of running spectroscopy. Uh, is that a bird? <laughs> My parrot, sorry. Oh, yeah, parrot. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's good to have company of all sorts. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, hopefully uh, the, that five-year study will give us an idea uh, about uh, when the pigment starts uh, so that we can safely start 
uh, nicotinone in children and minimize any effects on the brain when we finally get going. Um, and then there was a question, does nitisinone, this is again from Claire, increase the risk of a specific group of infections or is it more generic? Uh, it seems to be all sorts. So uh, in fact, we're actually thinking therefore, you know, it decreased, uh, there was an increase in uh, bacterial infections, urinary tract infections, flu, pneumonia, sore throat, conjunctivitis, uh, we also had viral infections, herpes zoster, herpes simplex. Uh, we also had fungal infection, thrush, all sorts were increased. So um, therefore we think that it might be that homogenic acid is boosting the immunological system in some way to, to, to improve your uh, immunity and therefore minimize the risk of infection. We're still working on it. So we've also, I suppose it's okay to say this next, uh, we have a patent. We have applied and got a patent uh, to develop homogenic acid treatment for people without AKU to prevent infection. Okay, isn't that extraordinary? Uh, we we started out when we had the AKU program to get rid of AKU. Now we are on the track to give AKU to people, to normal people, so that they can fight infection. How interesting is that? Um, and then Stacy asks, is there a dietary protein goal, um, kilogram body weight with or without nitisinone? Um, it, if there's no, so without nitisinone, there's no data to say that going on a low protein diet actually slows down your AKU or makes it better. Um, in children, there are some anecdotal reports that this is beneficial, but in adults, there isn't any. Okay, I think in France, they've used very low protein diets uh, to treat AKU and they've had some success, but that is very low protein, so much so that uh, people don't develop fully. They because they're small, um, you know, they are a bit isolated because, you know, they're not participatory. Uh, uh, and all of those reasons. And of course, once you get to a certain size, once your body weight reaches a certain uh, a level, you're breaking down protein and making protein every day, which means you're releasing tyrosine. And therefore, from the tyrosine, you're making homogenic acid. So uh, it doesn't, doesn't quite work. But, uh, but if you were to ask me, should I be eating a lot of protein or should I moderate my dietary intake if I've got AKU? I would say, yes, please, please moderate your intake. Excessive dietary protein intake is not a good idea. Really good, thank you. Um, next one's from Lever, 33, 34 years um, in Latvia. My country does not provide any support for me. I'm the only AKU patient in the country. Is there any option for me to have any support in Liverpool or anywhere else? Not really sure what could be the be what the best thing I could do to prevent or limit possible AKU symptoms in the future. Um, uh, this is a difficult one to answer because 34 years is a good age because you probably don't have too many symptoms. You might have some early back pain or early knee pain. Uh, you probably won't even have any pigment in the eye or ear, or if it is, it'll be very slight. Uh, so this is a very good time to be thinking about um, uh, some sort of active treatment. Uh, I, if you can't get hold of nitisinone, I don't know what to suggest. I think Liverpool is a very expensive place. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, if you, you know, I, I don't know, if I, if I was in Latvia and I was in a, uh, in a job and I would save some money and maybe get hold of nitrogen uh, 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 that way because there are some generic nitrogen available. So some cheap generic nitrogen available, relatively cheap. Uh, so to give you an example, up to 1,000, 1,200 um, pounds per year. So 100 pounds a month. Uh, so if you do that, then you can slow homogenic acid levels down. So I guess I'm saying to you, without actually going on nitrogen, your homogenic acid levels are not going to be controlled and therefore uh, I don't know what you can do to, uh, to prevent that. 
uh, the suggestion will be think about the jobs you're doing, think about the occupations you're doing, minimize stress on your bones and joints, but still keep active. Uh, you know, swimming is a good exercise, uh, walking is a good exercise, cycling is a good exercise, uh, but otherwise contact sports or risky sports uh, are not a good thing. Jobs, again, think about the jobs that are less, uh, less difficult for your body. Um, so try and see if we can uh, if we can address that in some way and your lifestyle. Uh, again, think about uh, the amount of protein you eat. Uh, certainly, you don't want to be eating Atkins diet, which is a lot of high protein diet. So um, that is really common sense uh, kind of person. One of the things that uh, the National Institute of Health have found is that uh, 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 working out is good, but working out to maintain flexibility is a good idea rather than building up muscle. So maintaining flexibility uh, is a better way because you're probably breaking up the pigment in your body from coming together. Uh, that's about all I think you can do. Uh, in terms of coming to Liverpool, it's a very expensive thing. We do have patients, private patients who come to Liverpool uh, and they, they self-fund themselves. And uh, I don't charge them for the report, but, but there's still some charge uh, for some of the things we do, but it's very expensive. Uh, so uh, my suggestion is see if we can find, uh, if not in Latvia, so, uh, somewhere closer. Maybe Slovakia is probably the closest because Pishtani is the closest to you and they have, the, uh, they have a center, National Cup Center in Pishtani. Uh, and maybe uh, uh, Nick or Juliet can put this person in touch with uh, Richard and see if there's anything they can do there. Sure, yeah, that's not a problem. Um, the other thing is uh, to check whether Latvia is part of the European Medicines Agency. Mm. If it is part of the European Medicines Agency, then you need to look out for hopefully nitizanone being approved by the European Medicines Agency before the end of the year. Once it's been approved, and if Latvia is part of the European Medicines Agency, you can go to your government and your health service and ask them to prescribe it for you and get it reimbursed. Yeah, that's a very good suggestion because once it's licensed by the European Medicines Agency, uh, at least you've got clinical evidence to take to your healthcare providers in your country and fight for it. That sounds great. Um, Stacey asks, is there any best practices regarding exercise to manage or prevent symptoms? I know you kind of touched on it a bit before, but I don't know if you have anything else to add, Ranga. Um, nothing else, really. But I, I, as I said, I think we have found that swimming is very good exercise. We have an example of a patient, 70 years old, uh, man, because men generally have worse disease, more severe disease than women. Uh, he was 70 years old hadn't had a single joint replacement. Uh, he was still upright uh, and he was swimming every day. Okay, he was swimming every day uh, and he's always been swimming. Uh, and uh, so uh, maybe swimming is a wonderful exercise for your whole body because it, it's stretching and strengthening all at the same time. Uh, so that would be a good thing. Um, Again, walking is a good activity, but of course you're loading your joints then. So depending on how much AK you have, you may or may not be able to do much of that. And same goes for cycling and things like that. It is good for younger people uh, with AKU who are looking to develop a lifestyle um, by following those. Um, uh, that's really all I can say. Again, as I said, stretching is good. Uh, some of the problems in AKU is because the uh, tendons get filled up with the uh, homogenic acid and they become hard and therefore uh, because your tendons if they become hard you are not very flexible you're not mobile and that causes pain so improving your flexibility generally I think is a good idea. Great um, we've got our first COVID question so uh, does COVID mean AKU patients are classed as vulnerable or more at risk as rare conditions are made reference to guidelines that I've seen thank you and that's from Natalie. Yeah, I mean, you know, this COVID thing was an interesting one because we addressed this. Um, so it, uh, the first thing to say is if, in, if you have AK, you're on it, known, there's an infection issue, which I've already touched, but I won't talk about that. Um, the second thing, of course, we did was 
um, uh, uh, some patients, if they have diabetes uh, or if they have general ill health, real ill health, um, or uh, if they're on immunosuppressant drugs uh, for other reasons, uh, so they are the ones at high risk. And we've classified about 20 people in our group, in our 80, in our 70 patients who are coming as being at high risk. One person went for a treatment for osteoporosis uh, and uh, the, he was given an infusion of a drug called Zolendronate. And of course, some people get a flu-like reaction lasting about a day if they receive this uh, Zolendronate infusion. For him, it lasted two months. So uh, again, uh, that was classed as a cytokine storm. Um, cytokines are inflammatory molecules and storm is a storm. And okay, COVID-19 is associated with something similar called a uh, cytokine storm. Uh, and of course, he's been notified uh, that it may be that the same thing will happen if he also develops COVID. So he's been reclassified uh, as being at high risk. So that is, if you've got AKU, it doesn't mean you're at high risk. As I said to you, if you're on a, if you've got AKU and you're not on it, you're probably protected. Okay. So uh, I hope that explains it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next question is, my daughter is nearly 18. She often feels some pain in her knees. What's the right age for her taking nitisinone? Should she keep a low protein diet? I think low protein is good, but don't overdo it for all the reasons that I've said. 18 is a good age. She's female, so she's chosen a sex well. Uh, so <laughs> it's important because biology, we don't know whether estrogen is important in terms of protecting women from the effects of uh, 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 AKU. So she's, that's on her side. Um, she's young, so hopefully she will not have had much in terms of uh, anything. Uh, she might have some pigment if you look carefully in her eye and ear, or if we did a biopsy and took a piece out. Uh, but but uh, we start patients on nitrocinone in the National Center from age 16, okay? Um, so our youngest patients are age 16, has been on nitrocinone for a couple of years now, uh, and a 17-year-old um, uh, a boy and a girl who started have been on nitrocinone for seven years, and they're all perfectly well. So no brain effects, uh, they're all doing well. Great. Um, yeah, that, that's brilliant news. Uh, we have uh, four questions left, and I think we'll continue uh this event till 1 15 but we'll just see um sorry that it's going a bit longer than usual but hopefully everyone can stay on so the next question is a follow-up question to the protein question is uh intake also changed based on tyrosine levels when on mitisinone yes absolutely so we have a, a cut off in the in our natural center generally um the, the levels of tyrosine in the blood are less than 100 in, no, in a normal person. So if you have AKU, your tyrosine levels are like a normal person and it's less than 100. If you go on nitrocinone, your tyrosine levels go up. Okay. And if it is less than 500, that's perfect. You don't need to do anything. Okay. If it goes above 500 but stays below 700, then we ask them to decrease the amount of protein they consume from one gram per kilogram body weight to 0 0.9 grams per kilogram body weight. If it goes more than 700, but less than 900, we bring it down to 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And if it goes more than 900, what we then do is we stop the nitrogen uh, briefly if necessary, or we get the dietitian to get involved and uh, also make them not eat normal food, uh, there's a liquid substitutes, which are tyrosine and phenylalanine, three called tyrocooler bags, uh, and they get given that. So, so instead of having a meal uh, where containing protein, you have this tyrocooler bag, uh, which gives you all the other things, uh, but except the tyrosine and phenylalanine. So, so that's the kind of way we manage. Of course, if you've got eye problem, tyrosine keratopathy, then uh, you have to stop the nitrogen for a couple of weeks at least. We usually ask them to stop for a month or two before they restart with stringent diet. Usually the problem is that people are not really staying on a low protein diet. That is the reason why this happens. 
Brilliant. Um, so next question, I have found some calcification on the ovaries. Is there any other patient with that? I am 40. As for men, it affects the prostate. Maybe it can affect the ovaries also. No, um, there's absolutely no effect on the ovaries. Um, I just like any normal, I mean, we do have a young patient who had cysts in the ovary, but then anybody can get a cyst in the ovary. I don't think it's anything specific to do with HKU. Brilliant. Uh, let me just find the next one. Um, how is it that one can get into the pediatric study? Okay. So the way to do this is uh, to contact me by email or you guys by email. And then uh, depending on, uh, I, I'm assuming this is a UK patient, because as I said, this study so for pediatric is only for a UK patient. We, at the moment, um, so we can make arrangements for the patient, for the child to attend locally to the local hospital. So, and the person who's coordinating this is a pediatrician in Birmingham, uh, Julian Raymond. Uh, we will inform him and then uh, we'll be delighted to, to accept patients. That's great. And yes, uh, this is a child four years old in the UK, so that would be yeah. fantastic. Um, does eating too much soya protein increase the tyrosine level? The what protein? Soya. Soya protein. Soya. Yeah. All protein is very similar. I, yeah, I, I've just said that, but it's not true. Uh, but I don't know how, how, whether you guys know it. Tyrosine comes from the Greek word tyros. Tyros is cheese. So cheese is full of tyrosine. Okay. So there are some foods which are more rich in tyrosine and others are much less in terms of tyrosine content. And I think if you do a Google, you will find foods that are higher in tyrosine content uh, compared to normal. So you can identify those and eat less of those. It's not that you can't eat those, eat those sparingly and in smaller quantities. Great, and last question uh, from Raphael. Due to my AKU, do you have evidence about cholesterol rates? I have to worry about specific numbers. No, not cholesterol. Um, homogenic acid doesn't seem to be linked in any metabolic reason uh, with cholesterol. So it's got nothing to do with it. It doesn't mean to say you can't have another problem but due to high, high cholesterol, but that's a, a separate problem. Nothing to do. Brilliant. And uh, does anyone have any questions just to speak out loud or is that everything on the question front? Um, obviously, this is a great opportunity to ask any burning questions. Um, um, yes, I have, please. Um, I did put one on the chat. Oh, did I skip it? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought I was getting all of them. But yes, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering um, if our families would be um, checked for uh, the genetic side of it. I have one gene and have the AKU and I wonder did that make it more uh, of a risk for our children or less of a risk to to get this disease? Okay, uh, Alcapnia is an interesting condition. It's called what is uh, what's known as an autosomal recessive condition. So uh, but the chance of having a mutation in any part of the disease is about one in a million, spontaneously in nature. Um, so of the cells in my body, all cells in the body, uh, they might be having a mutation one in a million, uh, even in me. And those defective cells are removed by the body and got rid of. Um, so um, the, the, for AKU, uh, it is the result of two mutations um, in the homogenic acid dioxinase enzyme, okay? So to break down homogenic acid, you need an enzyme called homogenic acid dioxygenase, HGD. So uh, this, this enzyme is coded by a complicated gene and mutations in the gene causes this homogenic acid dioxygenase, HGD, to be inactive. And if you got an inactive enzyme, then uh, you get AKU. So each gene, um, uh, but has a gene, is, has got what's called a pair of uh, genes. So it's a gene loci. So uh, the HGD gene, there are two genes in the body that determine whether you've got homogen cell dioxinase enzyme or not. And uh, if you have one gene that's not working, you're not going to have AKU. 
So having one normal HGD gene uh, is enough to prevent AKU. <coughs> so in AKU, the problem is both those genes are damaged and therefore you get AKU. Now, if when you have children, of course, there are implications in terms of family. So for a person with AKU, you got the gene from your parents. Both your parents have contributed one gene which has come into you as two genes. Of course, when you have children, you have the chance of passing this AKU gene down to them. So all your children will be carrying the gene, 100%. So they'll all have one gene, but it's not enough to cause the disease. So if you're unlucky enough to marry another person who either has AKU or either has one HGD uh, gene which is not normal, then there's a chance it could come together and form AKU. Is that, that, that make it? Uh, one of the things we do in the National Center is we can offer a genetic screening uh, to children to track it. And I know Leslie was doing something about this. Maybe she'd want to say something about that. <clears throat> but to keep it simple, if you've got AKU uh, and you have children, they won't have AKU. They will be a carriers of uh, AKU gene, but they won't have AKU. So how, how have I just got one gene instead of two? That's what so, I'd... Uh, are you saying you've got one gene rather than two? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, that means our testing techniques are not very good. So what we have found, uh, truly, because, uh, you know, we have just done a study with uh, NHS England called the 100,000 Genome Project. Uh, and there are a few, a couple of patients in the National Land Capital Center cohort who we have only identified one mutation. We didn't identify two. And that's just because genes are made up of, a gene is quite a large place. There are some places where uh, the gene is quite active, active parts in the gene, and there are some inactive parts in the gene called fillers. Mm -hmm. When we do gene screening, we generally concentrate on the active parts, and people don't tend to take notice of the inactive parts. And when you start looking at the inactive parts, you can find the mutation in everybody. <coughs> the other way to look at it is sometimes the body is quite complex, and uh, maybe it's not the HGD gene. There's another gene somewhere which is influencing the HGD gene indirectly. Uh, so, uh, and we don't know, we're not clever enough yet to uh, try and work out how that's happening. Uh, but there's no question that if, you're a, if you have AKU, uh, both your genes are not working properly. Okay. And you can't pass the gene on to your children. Thank you. But, so you can pass the gene on to children, but you can't pass the condition on to children because you can only pass one gene on to your children. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Leslie, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything about the genetic screening. Yeah. So we're part of a project called Breaking Down Barriers. And we've been fortunate enough to receive funding for three years on this project for different projects each year. And our third year project is um, around genetics. And that's looking at um, extended family um, of, of groups that we might consider of higher risk. So initially, we're looking at those families that come from South Asian or other ethnic minority groups. And we'll be offering genetic testing to their extended families. It's still in the early stages at the moment. We're just calibrating the system that we're going to use and planning how we'll move forward with that and what policies and processes we will need to have in place. But as soon as everything is ready, and, and of course we've gone beyond the COVID um, work that a lot of the laboratories are focusing on at the moment, then we will start approaching some of the families from the center. Um, and the long-term hope is that we might be able to obtain um, more funding to look at this in the long term and be able to offer it out to a much wider group. So that's where things are at at the moment. But anybody that's interested in that, then just make contact with me and I will keep you updated as we progress. The, uh, the cost of a genetic screening is about 500 pounds, just so you know. This is the reason why it's not routinely offered for 
fabulous really because it's a lot of money thank you does anyone else have any like final questions um just don't want to miss anyone out um just unmute yourself if you do Hello everyone again. I have a question about this uh, new drug that uh, Nick uh, talked about that breaks down the tyrosine. Uh, is it a new drug or just an uh, old one but uh, uh, new, using the new way? So, nitrosine uh, has been used for more than 30 years. Not, not nitrosine, no, this another drug. Uh, tau. The tau. tau. Oh, tau. It's, it's not ready yet, uh, you know. So, in 2014, it came up the idea because once we started using nitrosine uh, in people, they, we very quickly found out that it is, um, you can go on nitrosine, but you have to restrict your, law of your diet forever. Yeah, while you're on nitrosine. You can't eat too much protein. It's quite restricting. So we were started thinking, how can we overcome that? Uh, and TAL is tyrosine ammonia lyase. So this is an enzyme that can break down tyrosine without going through the homogenic acid step. So it breaks it down in a completely different way. Uh, and this is an important enzyme in plants. Um, and our idea is to give this possibly as a yogurt. So with each meal, if you can drink this yogurt containing this towel uh, and you can eat normally and then you just break down the tyrosine in your gut and you're not absorbing the tyrosine into the gut and you're still eating normally and you prevent the tyrosine from going up in your body and less concerns. Um, and it's not just we're preventing eye problems in older people on nitrosine. We can also start a, at a younger age. Maybe we can start from birth uh, with nitrosine and uh, minimize the risk of brain damage and all the rest of it. So we're quite excited about it. Um, <clears throat> it's been quite difficult to get this going, even though the idea came up in 2014. Uh, but we are working with an American company, uh, and they do have an enzyme. Uh, early studies suggest that it has some activity, but we need to do more tests on it to be absolutely sure what we've got. Okay. Yeah, so thank you. <coughs> Um, there was just a, a question from Natalie in the chat. If you wanted to go ahead with, this is back on the genetic screening and pay, how would you do this and what does it tell you? I, it, okay, so if, um, uh, for example, uh, you know, Brenda was asking about her children saying, will they have uh, the, the gene? Yes, the, the, her children will have the gene, uh, but they won't have the disease. So the question is, if they marry, uh, will they have, uh, how will, will, what's the risk of AKU? So the gene frequency in the population is about one in 500. That means you've got 500 people in a room, purely by chance, one of them is going to have this um, AKU gene. Okay. So, uh, so Brenda's children will, will need to meet this one in 500 person uh, and uh, all, all the things have to go right in terms of inheritance for that gene to end up uh, in uh, with uh, with uh, Brenda's children to get the AKU, okay. And these things can all be worked out, um, and there are ways, uh, calculations, uh, uh, mathematical calculations one can do to work out what the risk is. So locally, uh, there are uh, ge genetics is becoming an important specialty in medicine. So clinic clinical genetics, there are clinical geneticists uh, that are available definitely in the UK. Uh, and I suspect all around Europe as well now. So if anybody has got a question, try and find your geneticist locally. Brilliant, and I think that's it um, on questions, or I think I might, another one might have just quickly come through. When might the tau be, oh wait, Nick's just answered it, but I'll, I'll read it out, I'll say what Nick just said. When might the tau be available on the market here? Any rough idea? And Nick said, uh, a few years. Um, Josie's just quite asked a question. I haven't heard of the brain damage you mentioned. Could you explain this a little bit more? If we don't have a chance, then where could I find like more information yeah. on this? So in hereditary tyrosinemia, which is a fatal condition, so babies that have this condition called hereditary tyrosinemia type 1 uh, don't usually live beyond two years. They die from liver cancer, liver failure. So in those children, you have to give them nitrosinone to save their lives. 
uh, it is life saving. So there's no question of uh, worries about side effects of nicotinol. It's life saving. But it's been found, depending on which paper you read, anything from 50% to 10% of children develop learning difficulties. Okay. So that means uh, it's a code word for saying uh, that uh, their brains are not developing normally, that there's brain damage. Okay. And we think that because of, uh, or at least the metabolic physicians think it's due to the tyrosine levels being high, causing problems in terms of the brain development. And there are some mechanisms, biochemical mechanisms there that could work, like neurotransmitters and things like that, um, that being formed from tyrosine, uh, being affected by that. So that is the theory. Uh, and, and of course, one of the problems with having learning difficulties is it's there forever. You can't, we don't know how to make the brain go normal. Okay, so it's a bit like cartilage. We don't know how to get the cartilage normal if they're badly damaged in AKU. So with the brain, if it's damaged, then they're damaged forever. So we don't want that. So therefore, uh, we have data in the natural center that if you start from age 16, there's no damage. Okay, so maybe it's something about babies' brains because they're growing, they're more vulnerable, uh, and uh, that you need to take care of that in terms of the tarsin levels. Okay, so that is the data that we have at the moment. Brilliant, thank you so much. And that's kind of it on questions. I know it's obviously we have overrun a bit, but thank you so much for such an engaging discussion. Um, yeah, and if you have any more questions, do please contact our CAQ Society or Rango. We can answer them a bit in more detail, similar if you want cool or anything like that but um, I hope this has really helped everyone just understand a bit more what's going on with the coronavirus and just get obviously an update and thank you so much. Um, I have a request for you uh, Juliet can you ask all of the participants with AKU even if they're wrong even if their memory isn't great to send something to you to say have they had a lot of infections when they're growing up? We want to know their opinion to see, okay. uh, you know, what your infection state is like. When okay. Oh, and also, um, I was going to ask everyone just on thoughts about doing something like this again, like feedback as everyone. I can see in the chat that everyone seems very pleased, um, but I didn't know if anyone had any thoughts about continuing doing something virtual like this, like if you feel like it's useful to you. Um, and yeah, that would be great if anyone wants to unmute themselves or put in the chat. <laughs> I would love to go do it again. Brilliant. Yeah. And I can see everyone, everyone's saying it in the chat, which is great. So we'll um, obviously chat as a team, but um, we'll organize this again because obviously we, we can't meet up in person. So it's good to do virtual, virtual things now. But, um, but thank you so much, everyone. I hope you've had a good hour and a bit and hope you enjoy your lunch or whatever time it is where you are. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Have a great day. Thank you a lot. Bye. Good meeting. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.